This is the great man-made river, a colossal engineering feat buried beneath the sands of Libya. Dubbed the world's largest irrigation project, the Libyan government even went as far as calling it the eighth wonder of the world. And to many, that wasn't just propaganda. This bold and ambitious project was the dream of Libya's former leader, Muammar Gaddafi. His vision, to turn Libya's arid desert into fertile land as green as the Libyan flag during his regime. A completely green banner representing the Libyan Jamahiriya. But how close did they come to realizing that dream? How was this river built beneath the desert? And what has become of it today? Let's dive into the story of a river without a drop of surface water. A mega project born out of desperation, vision, and oil money. Let's begin with the geographic reality of Libya. It's a country located in North Africa, with its entire northern edge lining the Mediterranean Sea. But beyond that narrow coastal strip lies a vast and unforgiving landscape, the Sahara Desert. In fact, about 90% of Libya's land area is desert, and half of it is classified as sand desert, a literal sea of sand dunes and rock. Libya's biggest geographical disadvantage is its lack of freshwater resources. There are no permanent rivers or lakes to speak of. Instead, it has wadis, dry riverbeds that occasionally fill with water after rare rainstorms, only to evaporate quickly. These conditions make Libya one of the driest nations on Earth. Most of the country's rainfall is concentrated in a tiny sliver along the coast, which makes up less than 5% of Libya's total area. Even there, average annual rainfall is just around 4 inches. In the interior, rain is practically non-existent, falling in brief, heavy showers at the end of winter and early spring. That's it. Unsurprisingly, most of the population clusters in cities along the coast where water is at least somewhat available. According to data from 2020, nearly 80% of Libyans lived in urban areas, roughly 5.4 million people out of a total population of 6.8 million. In rural regions, people survive in small pockets, mainly around oases, using traditional irrigation methods for farming. But water access remains a constant struggle. Water scarcity is a well-known crisis in the Middle East and North Africa. The reasons are many. Scorching temperatures, high evaporation rates, limited rainfall, and a growing population. Libya is a textbook example. In fact, the World Resources Institute ranks Libya as the sixth most water-stressed country on the planet. Back in the 1960s, Libya began experimenting with desalination, removing salt from seawater to make it drinkable. But it was an expensive and limited effort. Then, in 1969, everything changed. Muammar Gaddafi seized power in a military coup, and soon, his administration began eyeing a much grander solution, the Great Man-Made River Project. Interestingly, Libya's water woes actually predate Gaddafi. During the 1930s, under Italian colonial rule, water shortages were already a major issue. But back then, Libya lacked the money, manpower, and technology to tackle such a challenge. That all changed in the 1950s, when oil exploration began in earnest. In 1953, while drilling for oil in southern Libya, foreign companies made an unexpected discovery. Not only did they strike large oil reserves, they also tapped into massive underground reservoirs of freshwater. It was like hitting the jackpot twice. Further studies revealed that this water came from the Nubian sandstone aquifer system, one of the largest fossil aquifers in the world. This ancient groundwater is believed to be between 10,000 and 1 million years old, formed back when the Sahara was a much greener, wetter region. Over millennia, this water became trapped deep underground beneath thick layers of sandstone. The aquifer stretches beneath four countries, Libya, Chad, Sudan, and Egypt, covering an astonishing 770,000 square miles. It's estimated to contain around 39 quadrillion gallons of water. That's an almost incomprehensible amount. At first, the Libyan government considered using this water for large-scale desert agriculture. But by the early 1980s, the strategy shifted. A new plan emerged. Instead of trying to farm in the desert, why not transport the water to the densely populated coast? It seemed far more feasible than investing in costly desalination plants that the country couldn't afford to operate or maintain. The coastal aquifers, especially around Tripoli, were also becoming increasingly salty and polluted due to overuse. Meanwhile, a giant reservoir of pristine freshwater lay untouched in the desert interior. The only problem? No one lived near it. The water had to be brought hundreds of miles across harsh, empty terrain. Thus, the Great Man-Made River Project was born. Despite its name, it's not a river at all, but an immense network of underground pipes, aqueducts, reservoirs, and pumping stations designed to move water from the heart of the desert to Libya's cities and farmlands along the Mediterranean coast. But building such a river was no small feat. Construction was divided into multiple phases. The idea was to drill deep wells, 
some over 1,600 feet into the ground, tap into the aquifer, and then transport the water through a massive system of pipes. By the time it's completed, the network is expected to span over 2,500 miles, with a capacity of more than 1.6 billion gallons per day. In 1984, Gaddafi officially launched the project and laid the foundation stone near the Sarir Aquifer in eastern Libya. The first phase of the project, known as GMR-1, was focused on two fields, Tazerbo and Sarir. Hundreds of deep wells were drilled, and the water was pumped through twin pipelines to Ajdabiya, where it was stored in large reservoirs. From there, it was distributed to the coastal cities of Benghazi and Sirte. By 1991, Phase 1 was complete. It consisted of a 990-mile-long double pipeline capable of transporting 528 million gallons of water per day. To build it, engineers installed a staggering 250,000 sections of reinforced concrete pipe, each 13 feet wide and 23 feet long. These were the largest precast concrete pipes ever made at the time, manufactured at two giant plants inside Libya using steel-reinforced, pre-stressed concrete. The pipes were placed into 23-foot deep trenches using custom-designed cranes and bulldozers. Each joint was sealed with heavy-duty rubber gaskets and cement grout before being buried. The construction also included massive reservoirs. For instance, one reservoir near Ajdabiya spans over 3,300 feet in diameter and holds more than 6 billion gallons of water, essentially a man-made lake. The numbers are jaw-dropping. Over 5 million tons of cement were used, enough to build 20 great pyramids of Giza. The amount of steel wire used in the pipe reinforcement could encircle the earth 280 times. Just to appreciate the scale, consider this. Libya even built a monument out of one of these pipe segments to showcase the size of a single piece. Following the success of Phase 1, the second major section, GMR2, was launched in western Libya. Its goal was to supply water to the capital, Tripoli. Phase 2 began delivering water in 1996, pulling from wells in the Jabal Assa area. Additional phases were planned to connect other regions of the country, with the long-term vision of supplying water for agriculture, domestic use, and eventually industry. Water from the great man-made river was intended to revolutionize farming in Libya. In theory, it would irrigate thousands of acres of land, boost food security, and reduce reliance on imports. And for a time, it seemed to be working. But the project wasn't without criticism. Many scientists warned that fossil water is a non-renewable resource. Once it's used up, it's gone forever. The Nubian aquifer is not actively replenished, especially not in a region where rainfall is so rare. Some also questioned the environmental and geopolitical implications of extracting water shared by multiple countries. Then came the civil war. After Gaddafi's fall in 2011, Libya plunged into political chaos. Maintenance of the great man-made river became difficult. Many of the pumping stations and pipelines were damaged during the conflict. In recent years, armed groups have even used water flow as a bargaining chip, cutting supply to cities like Tripoli for political leverage. What was once a national symbol of pride is now struggling to stay functional. Still, the great man-made river remains a powerful example of human ingenuity, a testament to what's possible even in one of the harshest environments on Earth. Whether it will continue to provide water to future generations, however, depends on Libya's stability, resources, and commitment to managing this fragile legacy. So, did they manage to turn the desert green? For a moment in history, they came close. But the river, like the nation that built it, now stands at a crossroads. 